Mr. Chargé d'Affaires, Robertson, Rector Akana, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Istvan Reva, I'm the director of the archive that was uh, in the privileged position to provide space uh, for this exhibition that arrived to us uh, by the help of the US Embassy in Budapest. Uh, we were really glad to be able to have this exhibition here where usually we show very ugly things um, to the visitors, um, things that relate to um, the history which sometimes would be better to forget but we can't and should not. Look at and we are very grateful to have this exhibition here in the Galleria Centralis. Um, I would like to um, tell you what might happen uh, after uh, this introduction. Um, Mr. Robertson, who in lack of an ambassador at the moment, uh, is the head of the US mission in Budapest. Um, he will have a few words after, perhaps uh, the rector of the CU, Yehuda Elkana, uh, will uh, uh, make his comments and remarks. And um, after that, uh, we are in the uh, fortunate position to have uh, Valentine Judge, uh, the director of Chicago Office of Cultural Affairs, uh, here with us, uh, who played an important role uh, in uh, having this exhibition here. And uh, I would like uh, sadly remark that the other person who uh, played a very central role um, in uh, uh, curating this exhibition, Mrs. Barbara Lee Diamondstein Spiegelfogel, uh, the wife of the US ambassador in Slovakia, um, is unfortunately on her way uh, from the Hungarian border uh, to the exhibition hall. The ambassador had a meeting with the Slovak foreign minister and this is why they were not able to leave uh, before. But uh, they will join us uh, for the reception after the opening. And I would like to tell you that uh, uh, after the opening uh, uh, we will be able to listen to uh, some uh, real native uh, New York and Chicago music. Uh, we have two excellent uh, jazz musicians here with us, Joseph, Joseph Balog, who plays the clarinet, and uh, Istvan Djarfash, uh, who is a guitar player. Thank you very much, Rector Elkana. Greetings to all. Having been here now for a year and a half, I wasn't surprised to hear from my friend Istvan Rev that standing beside him and being on the program I will perhaps open the I will perhaps open the exhibition. This is very much what I learned here in Hungary. You can't be sure about anything. Perhaps it will happen, perhaps it will not happen, but anyhow it is happening. When you look at this wonderful picture collection, you could make a few remarks either on the photography or on architecture itself. I chose to say decided to say a few words about the idea of architecture. Because if you look at American architecture, Chicago, New York, and many other places, stronger even than in many European countries, you are struck with the idea of a political architecture. In other words, to try to understand the political meaning, what does it mean that huge, suddenly emerging cities choose at the same time to introduce hypermodern, very beautiful new buildings, sometimes built in a neo-Gothic style, except the size is 10 times that of a Gothic building, while parallel to it, the same people who live in those enormous buildings and build them prefer to live in the suburbs in a colonial wooden house, beautiful as it is, and you begin to ask what is the political meaning of all these things. And when I say that, I would like to draw your attention that none of these things is accidental. At the same time, I would like to warn from a simplistic political explication of these things. 
To give you a few examples of what I mean simplistic, we got all used to the idea that Nazi architecture is typically Nazi architecture, and somehow you can recognize it that it's Nazi architecture. I think it's total nonsense. If you don't happen to know which was uh, in what time a building was built, by whom, or in which country, and you try to look at it sheerly at the, from the quality of the architecture, you are very, uh, very often in the situation that you don't have the foggiest. Or if you look at the greatest national uh, Swiss painter, Ferdinand Hodler, at the beginning of the century, and you ask yourself, of the, of the 20th century, was this a Nazi painter or not, you immediately feel to what extent you are on a very, very sloppy ground. Uh, also, in a different sense, politi political architecture must be understood in a context. For example, half of the buildings, dilapidated as they are of Tel Aviv, but I live you know, of my country, are Bauhaus architecture. Except these are the tail of the Bauhaus, Bauhaus movement, the least known, the least successful, who came much too late to Palestine at the time, escaping from Hitler, and reproduced in huge quantities semi-qualitative Bauhaus buildings from the end of the Bauhaus period, by which time it didn't mean anything. And now Tel Aviv is investing enormous monies to reconstruct those rather uninteresting, mass-produced, ugly, late Bauhaus buildings, because this is Bauhaus architecture. So yes, every architecture has a political meaning, but that political meaning has to be very much seen in context. And the context in this case, comparatively, Chicago, New York, is extremely interesting because the emphasis on the wooden colonial houses is infinitely greater in the New York suburbs, let's say, than in the Chicago suburbs. Just as the neo-Gothic emphasis is much closer, the closer you get to Harvard, <coughs> than you get to Chicago. So these things are interesting, eye-opening, worthwhile, and important. And I only wish that important cultural historians like Karl Schorske or Gossmann in Princeton, who wrote about Basel and wrote about uh, quite a lot about uh, other European cities and Berlin and comparisons, would have spent the same intellectual energy to do a cultural, contextual, comparative analysis between Chicago and New York, we would possibly understand over mu is also much better American foreign policy. Thank you. You are the next one. I guess I'm next. Since this is the play of passing on the game, I'm supposed to introduce Mr. Robertson, the charge d'affaires of the American Embassy. Thank you very much, Mr. Rector. Um, let me first say that uh, since Istvan made his remarks, um, we are very lucky because uh, a couple of the special guests that he mentioned in his introduction who were stuck at the Slovak foreign ministers have in fact arrived. So I'm very happy to welcome uh, Mrs. Barbara Lee Spielvogel and Ambassador Spielvogel who are here with us now. Um, I'd like to say to Valentine Judge, Magda Kertes, to the Spielvogels, to Rector Elkana, to all of those of you here at the gallery who've put in so much work to set this up, thank you very much and uh, welcome to this wonderful exhibit. Um, I am especially honored to be here. I'm a little humbled because when this idea came up a couple of months ago, I had a boss in the, op in the office apart from me who not only was a New Yorker, but a Chicagoan as well, and of course said, this is one thing we want to do. And uh, that was Peter Tufo, who unfortunately uh, cannot be here today, is back in New York, but he has the advantage of being able to see all of these wonderful New York buildings live uh, most days when he goes to work. So uh, this is very special, and um, uh, it's especially nice to have the Spielvogels here, who are not only uh, been very active in sponsoring uh, this project in the many cities it's been in, but are also good friends and even neighbors of the Tufos in New York. Um, let me say it's, it's especially nice to have this exhibit in Budapest. As many of you know, Budapest is also a sister city of New York, 
and uh, uh, of course is a is a memorable city to anybody who's visited here. Uh, those of us uh, who've had the good fortune to serve here in Budapest uh, can never forget the architecture, uh, and it's even more appropriate that we would be bringing this exhibit here today. I think you Hungarians all know very well that the Hungarian Compromise of 1867, which created the twin Marcus, mo monarchies of Austria and Hungary, in turn led to the blossoming of this magnific magnificent capital. This city, of course, back in 1867 was not the city of Budapest. It was Buda and Pest and O Buda. And then they decided, of course, with the creation of the bridge and, and more traffic back and forth, that they would make it one city. So then it became Pest Buda and then Budapest. And as many of you who know the history of the city, it grew like a mushroom uh, such that by the time of the the first Hungarian millennium, if you will, in 1896, uh, the population was already about two million people. So it really mushroomed very quickly. And uh, of course, it really uh, achieved the glory of its culture there in that period uh, before World War I. I am told its growth rate was even faster than that of one of the subjects of our, uh, of our exhibit today, namely Chicago, known as the Windy City, the great city on the lake, the terminus for American agriculture, the takeoff point for settlement throughout the United States and particularly to the West, and the city that our poet Carl Sandburg called hog butcher to the world and the city of big soul, uh, shoulders. It was also the city of big ideas and big dreams with its, with its buildings thrusting upwards from the lake shore, a city be that believed that nothing was impossible, even turning around the, the direction of its river. Uh, it created a dominant school of skyscraper architecture, the Chicago School, that basically said, I am here, do with it what you want to. <coughs> you could burn it down, as happened when Mrs. O'Leary's uh, famous cow uh, knocked over the lantern in 1871, and then you can build it right back up, which happened, and of course it was stronger and more assertive than ever. <coughs> Though Chicago is certainly a city of great culture, like Budapest, great museums, great opera, great symphonies and theater. Chicago is not what I would call an elegant city. It's very powerful and I would say even a little raucous, certainly by European standards. New York, New York on the other hand, which uh, is a place so nice that they had to name it twice, New York, New York, as New Yorkers like to point out, it is the Big Apple, and its skyline is what the dreamers of the American dream imagine when they visualize the city of possibilities. It is tough, unforgiving, very alive, contradictory, and as we say in English, very much in your face, as New Yorkers also like to say. But it remains a city not only of possibilities, but of possible dreams, not just to Americans, but to people from all over the world. They think, like the song says, if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. New York, New York. Today, thanks to the Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs and the New York Historic Landmarks Preservation Center, we see images of the imprint that those who, who realized their dreams and who built New York and Chicago, many of whom were Hungarians, and the impact that they had on those cities. Those structures, the Brooklyn Bridge, Chrysler Building, Chicago Board of Trade, the Navy Pier, are part not only of American cultural heritage, but of our shared world heritage. Like the Parliament here in Budapest, like the New York Cafe, they belong to all of us. What the photos in this gallery and the wonders on the street outside should teach all of us is to appreciate what those who have gone before us have left us, and that we should hand on to those who go after us all of this as a tr cherished, tr cherished trust. Thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the exhibit. Let me, uh, I, it's my honor to introduce to you uh, Mrs. Valentine Judge, who is from the Chicago Office of Culture and who was instrumental in bringing this exhibit not only here to Budapest, but to a number of other leading European cities. Thank you very much, Valentine.
Köszönöm. Kedves vengedenk. Jó estét. And that is all of my Hungarian. But I am very happy to be here this evening. I want to thank Mr. Robertson for his history lesson. Uh, I don't have to do it. And I think the photographs do speak for themselves. And I hope you have a chance to read some of the wonderful captions that have been translated into Hungarian. I am thrilled to be here in Budapest tonight with friends, old and new, enjoying your absolutely gorgeous city. Uh, there is little to compare between Chicago and Budapest, but I would take exception with your statement that Chicago is not elegant. You, you obviously haven't been there lately, so I invite you to come any time. Uh, I think those of you who have been there, and those of you who look at some of these beautiful, elegant buildings, hopefully will be on my side. Now, I do, have a, I do have some thanks that I must make, especially to all of the staff at the United States Embassy. Brian Gus, Lila Matos have been very, very helpful. Magda Kertes has been helpful all along the way in helping us find some sponsorship for the exhibition and making contacts for us, and most especially to uh, Gabriela Ivash here at the gallery, with whom I have been in very close email contact over the past two or three months, and she's done a lovely job of installing the exhibition here. I'm very grateful to her. Now, I do have a brief message from Mayor Richard Daly of the city of Chicago, that elegant city on the lake, <laughs> and he is a very elegant mayor, but I would like to read it briefly. It's to the Honorable Dr. Gabor Dembski. Dear Mayor Dembski, as mayor and on behalf of the city of Chicago, I extend warmest greetings to you and all the citizens of Budapest as you present the exhibition, Landmarks of Chicago and New York. In featuring this exhibition of architectural treasures of Chicago and New York in the Open Society Archives at Central European University, students and the citizens of Budapest have the unique opportunity to experience American cities. In our new global economy, it is critical that we continue to experience different cultures and form new friendships. We must realize that diversity is one of our greatest strengths the successful collaboration that developed between our two cities to bring this exhibition to Budapest pays tribute to the commitment we share. I thank you for your support of this excellent exhibition and offer you best wishes for continued success. Sincerely, Richard M. Daly, Mayor. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce my colleague and friend, Barbara Lee Diamondstein Spielvogel. Thank you very much. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished sponsors and distinguished guests for coming together to receive us and some of our ideas and our values and concerns that are reflected in the architecture that you see here. Um, it is interesting that our first distinguished speaker talked about architecture in terms of politics. And the, one of the things that he said that I do agree with is that in the end, a building, which is inescapable, is indeed a political act. But then again, I believe that almost everything that each and every one of us do every single day is a political act, either by its presence or its absence. So I must now invite you to come to New York because I disagreed with so very many things that you said. And I would like to give you a personal guided tour to begin with in terms of the wooden houses. The wooden houses um, that the rector refers to um, are among the earliest buildings in New York. They date from the 17th century and that building that it was designated a landmark was one of the very first buildings that were designated in New York City. Um, the family that occupied that building has a family trust that continues to maintain it. There are very few wooden buildings in Manhattan, some in Staten Island, some in Brooklyn, but all of them by and large more than perhaps 50-ish years old. Now there are some houses in the first developments of Long Island that were clabbered houses, shingle houses, 
and in resort communities that are wooden houses. But if we were to describe the architecture of New York, it might be fair to say that most places, including Budapest, is known for its natural resources. Well, New York City is known for its unnatural resources. Soaring buildings of glass and steel, skyscrapers, monumental structures. In fact, um, we, my husband, Ambassador Spielvogel, and I, have had the great good fortune to live in Slovakia, where design diplomacy, if you will, the Russian architecture that I think is as identifiable as the Nazi architecture has made a distinct and detrimental impact on both the visual uh, skyline but the life of these communities. But more importantly, we've come together to celebrate a collaboration. <clears throat> if none of you are copyright lawyers, the real title of this exhibition is A Tale of Two Cities. The landmarks of Chicago and New York, if she introduces it, of New York and Chicago, if I introduce it. But it has, it deserves now to be called Chicago and New York, and I will give you a little idea of the collaboration. Um, as chair of the Historic Landmarks Preservation Center, <coughs> excuse me, a book that I wrote, one of many about architecture and design, was a volume about the landmarks of New York. It opened at a museum because I think the test of an idea is not only its use, but its reuse, like many good buildings. It opened in New York, opened at a museum, and its stay was extended month after month. We asked our good friends in Chicago, whose architecture, whose dignity, whose courage, whose elegance we admire, and spirit and music too, and its new waterfront that perhaps you can get Miss Judge to tell you about uh, as she walks around. If they would like to have a, this exhibition come to Chicago, and wouldn't it be a good idea if we were to have the architecture of New York and Chicago together? Well, they are the most agreeable and creative people to work with. The answer was yes. And from there, I guess this is our ninth city around the world. And much, uh, not much, most if not all of that organization of sending it around the world has been the responsibility so well executed by our admired friend Valentine Judge, and we appreciate that a great deal. And we have many more cities to go to. So any suggestions or comments, and I hope they're friendly, that you would care to share with us, we would like to hear. But once again, thank you from Ambassador Spielvogel and myself. And there is a part of me that makes a special tribute of this show, with your permission, to Ambassador Peter Tufo, who was raised in Chicago, has spent his life in New York, and very much wanted to be here to be a part of it. So I want him to know we are thinking of him and we're delighted to be here. Thank you all. Thank you very much. So we consider the exhibition uh, as open and uh, you are kindly invited to a reception uh, over in the aula uh, of the university, the reception by the American Embassy. Thank you very much. It's very nice very to meet you. Thank you. Thank you for your nice hospitality. It's interesting. And they've done a nice job of uh, mounting.